Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation of the Bayesian Trading Edge. We are very fortunate to have Luke Miller, host of the Bayesian Analysis and Bayesian Signal Alert Services at ElliottWaveTrader.net. Also in his spare time, Luke is a tenured financial uh, professor and consultant with dozens of Fortune 500 companies. Today, Luke is sharing more about his proprietary Bayesian timing system. Um, Luke developed and it was born out of his award-winning PhD studies in Bayesian decision theory. He's going to be sharing with us um, about how we can utilize this analysis in trading ETFs for the S&P 500, as well as gold, and miners, and oil, the U.S. dollar, and much more. So I know we have a lot to cover tonight. So without further ado, please allow me to welcome Luke Miller. Luke, thank you so much for being here. Hey, thanks, Tom. I really appreciate that. And welcome, everyone. I really appreciate your time. I know your time is very valuable. So we'll go and get started here. As Tom alluded to, I'm going to be discussing the Bayesian service. So you have a little better idea of what I go through on my end on a daily basis. And then also talk about uh, a few, few uh, service components. So we're going to go in here. A uh, quick agenda for today's short uh, 20, 25-minute presentation. Do a quick background on myself, uh, how I got into what I do. I'm going to then introduce what Bayesian analysis is. You may have heard the term Bayesian. You may have Googled the term Bayesian. You may know what Bayesian networks are. You may know what conjugate distributions are. You may not. So that's okay. I'm going to introduce it as best I can, and uh, we'll step through there and answer any questions at the end. I'm going to show you how I do some forecasting with Bayesian and how that might be appropriate, and, and so that way you guys can sort of connect the dots on what it is I'm trying to get accomplished. Uh, and then I'm going to do build, build some Bayesian price pads which is basically what I'm talking about in the daily thoughts and how I calculate probabilities of future events. Um, uh, then I'm going to move on to more specifics about the Bayesian service on EWT. I'll do some Bayesian service examples in terms of uh, what I might be posting and how you might use it. And then I'm going to comment on boots um, and where that is and the status of what is going on with boots. All right, so that's our agenda. Let's get going here. A quick background on myself. So I've got a few degrees. Uh, BS stands for bullshit, uh, MS, more of that, and PhD is piled higher and deeper. So don't take me too seriously, other than to know that uh, I do have some formal training uh, in this. I also uh, got an award along the way to help me get through my PhD studies. I'm very proud of the fact that um, I was a United States Air Force officer. I'm presently a tenured finance professor um, and been doing that for nearly 20 years now. I've got a, a 17 and 19 year old, hard to believe. The older one is off to college. Um, I'm also very active with a range of large companies. Here's just an abbreviated list, uh, Morningstar, Amazon, UPS, uh, all the way down to some insurance companies, MMC, and some hedge funds. And I do a range of things. Most of it has to do with financial consulting, using Bayesian, and or decision analysis in general. So um, I try to stay very active. And I've been very fortunate to be invited by Avi about three years ago to bring some of my work into Elliot Wave. Uh, just a quick background on myself and how I got into what I do. As Tom alluded to, uh, my dissertation was actually in uh, the application of Bayesian real options, which is uh, really, uh, I was really the first researcher, gosh, almost 20 years ago now, to explicitly merge Bayesian decision theory, so that's Bayesian statistical decision theory, with option pricing theory. Um, and actually wrote a book on it. So, uh, and, and I, initially I applied my efforts to Firm investment decision making, which is what we call capital budgeting decisions. So firms are going to make large capital outlays. Uh, is there a better way that we can evaluate making that large investment decision? So I started my career doing that quite a, quite a, quite a few many years ago. Uh, that, that that naturally evolved because Bayesian is such a powerful tool for forecasting and evaluating unknown events. So it evolved to looking at forecasting and financial planning and analysis, which then evolved into what I do now. I uh, was applying it to financial markets. So that's kind of the, the natural evolution of my research. So if you happen to come across my CV online somewhere or Googling about me, uh, you might see that uh, I've, I've presented at all types of conferences, from engineering conferences to finance conferences, and I've applied Bayesian to a range of topics. Uh, just uh, you know, uh, uh, just an abbreviated list. Uh, I'm out there publishing and I'm out there presenting. Um, so let's get going here with the meat of the presentation. All right, so we hear this, this term Bayesian. So what is Bayesian analysis? Well, Bayesian analysis underlies learning systems like, like AI, for example, artificial intelligence. Uh, it's really a process by which how we as humans already assess and evaluate future events. So let me do a simple example here. Let's say you get, you're planning on driving from your house 
to your office. All right, and you know that based on your experiences and the time of the day and the weather outside, uh, that you can you take all of this information. It's subjective, but there is some there is some data in there, right? There is some information, and you take those experiences and you say, my best guess is 45 minutes. All right, and we call that an a priori belief. That is your that is your belief based off your experiences, your subjective slash objective experiences. And you're uh, with the world. Now you begin driving. So you get in your car and you head on out. And then uh, I'm up in New England area. So, you know, snow can come out of nowhere, right? So you're driving down the road and sleep and snow come out of nowhere. And all of a sudden you notice that your miles per hour starts to drop. That's your, that's your quantitative data, your miles per hour, which then obviously implies time to get to your location. So your miles per hour drops, we call that sampling information. So in your mind, then now you have to combine your a priori belief, your estimate, with your sampling information, and you're gonna recalculate uh, how long it's gonna take you to get to the office now, and you say, okay, that's 60 minutes now. That's your posterior belief. So you have just done a Bayesian revision. You start with a subjective belief based off of your experiences and your knowledge. You gather sampling information, which is data, very data-oriented. You then explicitly incorporate that data back into your a priori belief, and then you end up with a quantified probabilistic estimate of where you're gonna be going to next or how long it's gonna take you to get to work. Now, this is an iterative process. So that posterior belief will now become your new a priori belief. And the cycle's gonna repeat itself over and over again. So let's say you, you know, you're continuing your drive to work and just as quick as the snow and the sleet came on, it stops and the sun comes out. So you have your a priori belief from the iterative process of 60 minutes, right? The sampling information, you notice your miles per hour. Uh, hours increase again. You take that quantified data, cycle it back through your Bayesian mind. Keep in mind, all of us are Bayesian thinkers, whether we want to recognize that or not. And you recalculate it's going to take you 52 minutes total to get to the office. Now, this is the Bayesian learning process. It's an iterative process. It incorporates information, gathers information, incorporates that sampling information, and the process continues over and over and over again in a learning uh, manner. Uh, Google uses it to, uh, as part of their search engine. As I mentioned, artificial intelligence utilizes it. High-speed trains utilize it. Um, uh, uh, Elon Musk uh, uh, cars over at Tesla utilize it. All right? It is a way that you are calculating and evaluating data and information. It's really how the human mind works. But, we're try but what I'm trying to accomplish with it is the quantitative aspect, and especially of how securities price might, prices may move. So as a quick recap, this is a learning process that continues over and over again. You determine an a priori, you gather sampling information, you determine a posterior, and the cycle repeats over and over and over and over again. All right, so keep this example in mind. I'm gonna step through two more examples. One where I'm gonna start quantifying data a little bit, not quite what I'm doing uh, on Elliott Wave, and then I'm gonna branch an Elliott Wave. And again, all I'm trying to do here is provide you guys an appropriate context by which what I'm trying to accomplish with Bayesian, just because there seem to be a lot of questions about it. So let's do a second example here. I'm gonna do a little sales forecasting with Bayesian. Now keep in mind, sales forecasting could be similar to uh, where prices might be of let's say the S&P 500, one week from now, two weeks from now. So start making that reach, that transition, because that's where we're headed next. So let me give you another example. Let's say you're a national sales manager and you oversee 5,000 stores and your company's gonna roll out a new product, all right? So the first thing you're going to do as part of this Bayesian process is determine your A priority. Now, you're a sales manager at the national level. You've got a lot of experiences based off objective information, subjective information. Um, and you're going to take your experiences and you're going to evaluate that new product and compare in your mind to similar products that have launched in the past. And you're going to say, best guess, I bet I can sell 400 units of these per store. All right. Now, you quantify that further from a probabilistic standpoint by saying, and I bet there's even a 25% chance that I can do greater than 425 unit sales per store. Now you have just begun down a probabilistic decision making. So we have assigned a probability and we have a point estimate. So I'm gonna assume normality. So if you remember back to uh, uh, any of your educational over the years, a bell curve, a normal distribution. So we're gonna start simply, right? If you learn this stuff, uh, in graduate school or whatever, that you're gonna start with a normal distribution to learn it. So let's say that uh, you, you use the information and with these probability uh, estimates here, it's actually quite easy to determine what the normal distribution is going to be. So in this case, the normal distribution would have a mean, a center point of 400, and a standard deviation of 30. And 30, keep in mind, is a measure of uncertainty. It's a measure of volatility. It's a measure of how far you're going to be away from that middle point of 400. 
So that's your a priori belief, a mean of 400, standard deviation of 30, all based off your a priori belief. So we've quantified your a priori belief. Now we're gonna move forward here. We're gonna gather sampling information. So let's say you go out there and you launch this new product. And you put it in 100 stores. Keep in mind you had 5,000 stores total. You put it in 100 stores and you start collecting data on sales. Now you've just created a sample. Your sample size is 100 stores. The average number of units sold per store is 420. Now keep in mind, this is 100 stores of the 5,000. This is sampling information. You haven't done it in all of your stores. This sampling information is not perfect. All right, so part of what the Bayesian analysis is doing is interpreting the quality of your sampling information in combination with the uh, uh, level of certainty of your a priori belief. So it's doing lots of things all at once to then provide you this posterior belief. Now I'm gonna spare you the details of what's known as a Bayesian conjugate normal relationship. It's really nothing more than a big, fat, ugly mathematical equation. Uh, it is closed form, so it does make it easy to learn in a classroom setting anyway. Uh, so you're gonna combine this a priori with your sampling information to then get your posterior belief of where you think sales are going to be on a per store basis. If you do all that appropriately, and assuming my math was right, your average sales per store will be 214 with a standard deviation of 17. Okay, great, Luke, that's fantastic. We're playing with math, but why do you care? Well, let's see here, why should we care? Now, you started with an educated guess, all right? You started with an experience. Well, let's start thinking about Elliott Wave Theory. Let's start thinking about our highly qualified Elliott Wave analyst and where they're going with. They, they are pre preparing counts based off years and years and decades of experience analyzing charts. All right, but it's, it's subjective combined with objective. That could be an a priori belief, could it not? Anyway, so you start with an educated guess, you explicitly incorporate data into your decision process, and then you improve that educated guess. So I, the a priori in this example was a mean of 400, standard deviation of 30, posterior was 414, standard deviation of 17. But what I do wanna point out here is your standard deviation, which is a measure of uncertainty, has effectively been reduced nearly 50%. So in other words, you are 50% more confident in your estimates for stores and that's reflected by the relationships between the standard deviation. Obviously, 17 is about half of 30. All right, now we can even go one step further and start looking at the distributions assigned to these. So here, the blue line is the normal, the bell curve of your a priori belief. This is the center around 400. This is what you thought you would sell. Now, based off your sampling information, that distribution has shifted to the right to 414 center point. But notice the more important thing in my mind, all right, obviously, it's good to have the center point shift on you. So you, you're, but the uncertainty has been reduced. Whenever you have a normal distribution and effectively it scrunches up a bit and goes a little taller, that means you have less uncertainty. You have less tail probability event stuff going on there. And that is a critical component of what we're doing with Bayesian is we're trying to reduce uncertainty of our prior belief by gathering data. And then can we quantify that in a probabilistic sense afterwards? So, all right. Take a second to soak this in because we're going to move on now to price pass and then hopefully uh, you'll have some idea and I've laid enough breadcrumbs here. But keep in mind this system is proprietary. So I'm, I, you know, I, I'm sharing as much as I can. Uh, those of you guys more mathematically inclined, I know we have some very educated people in the Elliott Wave room that have masters and PhDs in statistics. You probably are right. You're probably soaking all this in. All this makes perfect sense. And if, and if you happen to major in English or something, don't worry about it because I'll talk about how you can use the service later. All right, let's do one more example here because I talk about price paths all the time in my daily thoughts. So I'm going to develop a few Bayesian price paths. So let's start. Here we go. We're going to develop an a priori price path. Now, I use lots of different stochastic processes. There's things like Brownian motion, geometric Brownian motion, jump diffusion, all these different things. Uh, there's even more complicated ones that don't have closed form, uh, pretty uh, 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 results. So you can use simulations for it. So Generally, I'm creating a simulation of a prospective price path. So let's say I, I started with SPY, and I started with SPY at 245, not unlike where we were last week. So if you've been following along with any of the posts, either in the room and or in the main service, uh, we have been long since last week, and we've been very fortunate to catch, oh, quite a big move up in indices uh, into, into this week thus far. So this is just you know trying to bring this example home as much as possible. So one price path. So let's say I simulate one price path and it looks something like this over the next 10 trading days. So this would be two full trading weeks. And you can see here, it starts at 245, it goes up a little, then kind of drifts up a little bit more. Well, that's just one price path, right? And I'm simulating many of these because one of them doesn't really tell me a whole lot. So let's say I already increase that and, and do 10 price paths. So now I've got 10 price paths forecasted for our uh, 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 where we believe the SPY is going to be 10 days from now. 
Now, I only do 10 there, so you can see, I, I still can't do much with 10. But what I can do is I can simulate this 100,000 times, 500,000 times, 1 million times, all right? With computing power, I'm able to do lots of simulation of prospective price paths into the future. It turns out that if I were to create a distribution of where SPY is going to be 10 days from now, all right, then uh, I can actually create histograms of what that looks like. I can actually create distributional forms by which I can then extract probability information from. So let's say in this particular example, I do 100,000 price path generations, and then I develop where SPY is going to look like the distribution, I call that the terminal distribution, where SPY is going to be 10 days from now. We can see here, it's got a center point, oh, it looks like around 265-ish. Uh, All right, keep in mind, we started at 245-ish. Uh, but we've got a range from uh, low 200s all the way up to the low 300s. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. Now, the bulk of this curve is, is you know, centered around 265. <clears throat> now, this is just my a priori belief, all right? I haven't even done the cool Bayesian stuff yet. Like th this stuff here, if you've, if you've had any work in stochastic calculus or anything along those lines, you're probably uh, somewhat uh, familiar with what I've just done here. Now comes the cool part. So as we, what we did before, this was our B, this is my a priori belief of where I think SPY is going to be 10 days from now. I gather lots of sampling information and boy, we're lucky. There is a lot of sampling information to gather for securities and traded instruments out there. Price action, volume, volatility, the Greeks from the options data. Uh, I actually use over 50 technical and candlestick indicators like MACD, RSI, on balance volume. Uh, you name it, uh, AD line, all of these things. I'm throwing all kinds of things in here. And this is kind of the secret sauce that I'm not going to give you too many details on, but I'm gathering all kinds of data. And I find it interesting that some people are like, oh, I've got a moving average trading system. Well, that's fantastic. I also have a moving average trading system, plus about 60 other items that I use as inputs and data into uh, my Bayesian revision. So this is my data. This is my sampling information. I found a way to then quantify and incorporate the sampling information back into my a prior belief, just like we did uh, with the sales example, just like you did with the driving example. I then take this sampling information <clears throat> and then I basically find a way to explicitly merge it with my a prior belief, which is already in probability terms. And I get a posterior distribution of where I think SPY is going to be based off all of those things. And, I, and if you have uh, and access to like a stockcharts.com or or a good charting software. And you have all those indicators you can click on. Guess what? A lot of those find their way into my analyses. So here's the posterior distribution. So look at what happened. It, it you know it started very clean, right? Because that makes sense. That that's a mathematical process. It's probably going to be somewhat clean. Now I introduce all this dirty real data, real time of what's going on uh, in the markets into this, and I get kind of a messy result. But I can start to get uh, it, messy in the sense it's not like a cleanly shaped distribution. But what I can start to do is I can start to see if I've learned anything or if uncertainty is being resolved or if the data is clumping around certain price points, which is where if you follow my daily thoughts, I say things like there's a prob this a probability will be above this price level at a certain point in time. So uh, this is what, and this is one iteration, by the way, one Bayesian iteration, all right? And so let's say, let's just study though. These are the same two charts. I've just put them on top of each other now. And so on the top chart is the a priori. The mean was around 265. I just did a ballpark estimate of range. I didn't want to get into volatility and standard deviation. So the range is roughly 130. That's roughly from the low end to the high end. So range is pretty spread out, mean of 265. Now, just from one Bayesian iteration with all that information, uh, my posterior belief has a mean of 271. It's creeping up on me. It's creeping to the right, all right? 265 to 271 is increasing a hair. And the range has slightly decreased from 130 to 110. So that tells me that uh, that the information that's being gathered about prospective price paths for spies as from last week from 245 is creeping up and to the right and uncertainty is being resolved. I understand the process a little bit more. Well, guess what? If we go back to our step four, if you remember the step four is repeat the process over and over again. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna repeat this process over and over again. I'm doing Bayesian revision after Bayesian revision on the on the a priori's become the posterior. The posterior becomes the a priori. The process repeats over and over again. So uh, I just took you through a few iterations here. Um, again, because we're using real data, you're not going to get like a perfect bell shape or a perfect triangular shape or any of these other things. You know, you, you'll get sometimes they're close, but but never spot on. And that makes sense. Real data is never perfect, as you guys know that. So. I uh, mean 273, uh, range 130, mean 275, range 90, mean 282, 
range 65. So if I'm looking at this type of information and this is last week and I'm trying to make a decision on where SPY might be 10 trading days from now, I'm thinking, oh, there is some type of upward infor upward press going on behind the scenes under the hood, probabilistically speaking, I'm seeing a shift in where that central data is pointing to me to be 10 days from now. And it's also uncertainty is being resolved, you know, reflected in an approximate level uh, by my decrease in my range. Now I find other ways to quantify this and, you know, but it, uh, this isn't obviously a PhD lecture. This is simply just trying to give you a taste for what it is that I'm doing. So as I note at the bottom, as we move through these Bayesian iterations, the distribution is shifting to the right in terms of uh, where the, this, uh, uh, where SPY might be in the future. And uh, the distribution is getting tighter. It means that there's more certain, there's, there's less volatility or variance around that. And so, you know, not, I mean, granted, we're only like day three or four into this projection, by the way. We hit 275 today in the SPY. We did pull back, but you, you know, and, and we're up in a lot of our positions. So, and we opened actually around 273 this morning. Look, I, I'm just simply telling you what the data is telling me, all right? And, and I'm, I'm seeing encouraging things that this run's gonna continue. Now, keep in mind, this is real data. So if things change on me again, then guess what? The signal will change, and I'll talk about what all that means here in a second. So again, I just wanted to give you a taste of this Bayesian process and what I'm doing and what I'm trying to get accomplished and how I'm trying to quantify probabilities for you. Um, now, let's talk more specifically for a few minutes about the service itself. <clears throat> and so the service is the Bayesian timing signal. Uh, so, sometimes we reference it as the Bayesian, Bayesian trading service, all right? So, uh, it doesn't really matter. It has some timing components to it as well um, with, with vibration windows. And unfortunately, I just don't have the time to get into that. If you have an interest, you should definitely check out the BTS uh, subscriber's guide. It's, uh, it's a nearly a 40 page document describing uh, how you might utilize the trading system to your advantage. <clears throat> now, using all this Bayesian price path information and generating these terminal distributions and doing the Bayesian revisions and calculating probabilities, I have then found a way to develop a trade signal based off of that, all right? So it's not much of a reach. Uh, the trade signal is either long, it means you buy this position, it's either short, means you're betting against it, or it's neutral. Neutral means we're gonna hang out in cash. We don't have enough information to put our hard-earned dollars on the line. We'd rather just hang out in cash. You know, sometimes we might miss a run, sometimes we might miss a, 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 a position that would have uh, really led to a negative uh, return. So. Uh, I really just follow the probabilities. I trade the probabilities. Uh, a trade signal will only trigger if there's a 75% chance of it being correct. So generally that's where I draw the line. So, um, and then you, you say, okay, well, that's just a forecast. That's just an estimate. You're saying it's a 75% chance of being correct. Hey, well, guess what? I've gone back and, and I test this and I retest this historical data from 2007 to the present. That's how long I've been utilizing the BTS. Uh, trade signals are between 70 and 80% accurate, which I'm targeting 75%. All right, and you could even go confirm this by looking at the trade table on Elliott Wave Theory. It's, I'm sorry, Elliott Wave Trader. Um, it's been, I've, I've been doing this for three years, and guess what? I'm in the 70 to 80% range for accuracy on all my trade signals, meaning that I say buy, that means 70 to 80% of the time, I'm going to be correct by the time we close that position out. Now, to compare this uh, to other trading systems out there, there aren't many that I know of that get anywhere near 70%. Your best, Technical indicators are in the 55 to 58% range. Uh, so if you use any of those standard technical indicators that you're going to be getting in any of those canned packages, those are the best ones. The worst ones are, are, are actually uh, less than 50%. A lot of them are right around 50, 50. Um, so what the BTS then is a, sw it is a swing trading system that's targeting whole periods of one to four weeks using a diversified portfolio approach. So in other words, a swing trade is effectively, I'm going to buy today and hold roughly one to four weeks. Now, obviously, as the volatility and things in the market change, sometimes whole periods will compress to one to three or four days. Sometimes whole periods will extend longer. As I've, even had whole, I've even had whole periods extend to months or even years. And, 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 and although that's not ideal, keep in mind that I'm doing my best to forecast the future. There is no perfect system. But about 80% of all the trades historically uh, fall within the one to four week hold period. Um, and so all I can do is try to improve the system. And this is what I've developed now to help me uh, in these projections. All right, so you might say, okay, what are some results? Now these results are also discussed in the guide. I went ahead and updated the results through the current signal set, because uh, I haven't done that in a while. Um, and, and, and I wanted to get that done. So if you follow the BTS optimal portfolio, which I'll, I'll discuss that on the next slide in terms of how you allocate your positions, 
uh, and you follow that, all right, utilizing the steps that, that are mentioned in the guide and what I'm talking about here, the BTS average annual return since 2007 have been 26%, all right? If I compare that to, let's say, uh, Warren Buffett over at Berkshire Hathaway, he's averaged 16%, including dividend payments, since over that same time frame, and he's, let's be honest, he's considered one of the most successful investors in U.S. history. If you go all the way back to the 1950s when Warren Buffett started, he did have much higher returns in his earlier years. So his aggregate uh, average return for his career has been about 22%. So Warren Buffett, considered one of the best investors in the world, averages 22% a year. This thus far since 2007, granted it doesn't go back to, 2000, it doesn't go back to 1950, but at least since 2007, it's done pretty well. Now, since I've been on Elliott Wave Theory the last three years, uh, it has it has underperformed its historical average. Everything's quantified. Everything's put up front you got, for you guys uh, in our service. It's averaged about 15.4%. Now, Berkshire, as of today's closing price, has averaged 14% a year. So I've even beaten Berkshire Hathaway over the last three years. The last three years, I would say, have been extraordinarily difficult. Gosh, we had this uh, COVID crisis going on now. I mean, those are that's really high volatility events. Uh, we've had some pretty steep sell-offs and some pretty atypical V-shaped recoveries. The last several years i'm not trying to make excuses i'm simply telling you when i go back and i quantify this and try to improve my system it's been very very hard so anyone out there that's had a lot of success the last several years kudos to you because it has been an extraordinarily difficult uh, uh market the last couple of years to trade so generally yes is it underperformed yes it has quantified yes it has a am i generally happy with it yes i can't complain given uh, uh the volatility and how difficult things have been um so what is this optimal portfolio that i keep referencing um, well, it's designed around a 10 bucket system. And all of this is laid out very, very clearly in the guide. Uh, at all times, basically, you should try to maintain the bucket allocation amount. Uh, neutral signal means that you're going to remain in cash for that particular bucket. So here, I just pulled uh, from the slide. In fact, I screenshotted this from the guide. You can see here that if you have a $100,000 portfolio, and let's say the SPY signal comes in and says, long spy go long spy it's a real-time signal provided throughout the day there's there's no wishy-washiness all right there's no oh maybe buy maybe not buy it's very clear it's time stamped exactly to the second buy spy right now at this price all right so if you get that trade signal comes in the door and you have a hundred thousand dollar portfolio devoted to this then you will buy sixteen thousand dollars of spy for your portfolio or 16 percent portfolio allocation if the qqq signal comes out and says buy q right now this second for this price then the allocation is 14% or 14,000. Uh, GDX is 6%, uh, SLV 7%, GLD is 13%, uh, USO 7, US, UNG, which is uh, natural gas is five. And the two other buckets, uh, these, are, these are signals that'll trigger like TLT or maybe a different type of ETF. And I'll go over the ETF list of signals that I cover here in a minute. So, and, and, and if you don't have a GLD signal active, that means it's neutral. It means that that $13,000 sitting there in cash, you're not putting it anywhere else. It's just sitting there in cash waiting to be put to use when you get that signal. So this is generally how the system works. When you get when you don't have a signal for SPY, the money's sitting in cash. When you have the signal for SPY, you're the shorter long it, all right? And the signals are real time and it guides you uh, through the process. All right, so let's move along here. Uh, so what do you get uh, with the Bayesian service? Just very quickly, and I know Tom might touch on this at the end as well. Um, but uh, uh, there, it, there are two things on the subscription menu. Well, there's one, this Bayesian analysis is 50 bucks a month. This is, this is an abbreviated version of what the full service used to be. So there are some members that don't, want, don't actually want the trade signals, and that, that's fantastic. That means you're probably a professional trader. Uh, you already have your own systems dialed in, and you don't want the actual real-time trade signals delivered to you uh, via text or to your email. Um, so what, what are you going to get if you pay 50 bucks a month? You're going to get Bayesian probabilities of all these long-term charts, which I'll comment on here in a second and what that means. Uh, you're also going to get discussion items every day around our current uh, uh, positions in SPY, GDX, or uh, sorry, uh, the SPX, GDX, USO, and DXY, which is the US dollar. Now, the additional $50 would be $100 per month or whatever. Uh, gets you the signals, basically. So it used to be the whole service was $100 a month, but we decided to offer a, a, an economically friendly $50 service for those that don't actually want the trade signals. So, but if you if you do opt, you get everything that includes in the Bayesian analysis service, plus you're gonna get real-time trade signals on over 30 ETFs. That's SPY IWN, you can read the list there. Uh, USO, XLE, SMH, XBI, TLT, the list goes on and on and on. You can come through the historical table to see what we've offered in the past. Now, the goal for me is to have 10 active signals going. Um, but that doesn't always happen. The market doesn't always give us enough, me enough information from a probability standpoint to affect those trades. Um, every now and then I'll throw in some extra trades. 
some bonus trades. And so some people are like, well, how do I account for those extra trades into the system? Uh, some people will take up uh, the, the other bucket and chop it up and put four items in their other bucket at 5% each instead of two at 10% each. Uh, some members ignore the extra signals. Some members uh, have a different type of trading account where they'll trade those signals outside of their BTS portfolio. It's really up to the user. Um, now, let me quickly talk about the daily uh, thoughts that you're going to be seeing here. Uh, part one in the daily thoughts that you receive every day posted on Elliot, uh, uh, on EWG is um, you're going to get Bayesian applied to all these long-term counts. All right, so first of all, I want to roughly tell you how I do that. I do it just like I do everything else in Bayesian. I start with an a priori belief, and in this case, an a priori Elliott Wave count. In this case, I'm very lucky. I get to work with Avi, one of the best LA Wave analysts in all of the world. So I get to start with an a priori belief from Avi, which he believes are his best guesses at best guesses of where things are going to be based off his experiences and all the stuff we talked about for an a priori belief. I then gather all that other sampling information that I told you about before, and then I run all of that sampling information basically through Avi's uh, a priori belief, all right? And then what pops out the other side is a posterior belief. So I take the a priori belief of Avi's counts, I add all this extra information to it, and then I interpret probabilistically what how the Bayesian is interpreting Avi's counts. And so what you'll notice is I the Bayesian analysis of Avi's counts, if you are in the service or haven't yet signed up for it, they don't always agree with Avi. A lot of times they do, but sometimes they don't. So sometimes an all count by Avi will be Bayesian's posterior beliefs, primary count. So I know that can be confusing. You know, do you go with Avi? Do you go with Bayesian? It's not a competition. All right. I'm just providing information for you to make decisions. That's all I'm doing here. All right. But that's all I'm doing. And the process is iterative and what have you. So what do you get? Here's an example from today's uh, daily thoughts from this morning. Section one, Bayesian analysis applied to Avi's longer term charts. All right, I'm not gonna read through this whole thing, um, but you know, just give you an example. Uh, again, very little to add. The Bayesian probabilities continue to support Avi's yellow count over his green count. So this, if you mind, this is from today. So beginning last week, and you could go back and confirm all this by looking at the daily thoughts last week. All this is for you to observe and see, nothing is hidden. Um, that I started talking last week that maybe this yellow count maybe has a little bit more thrust behind it than we're thinking right now. And the probabilities started to indicate that as well. So, uh, and so we talk about, that. I do the same thing for GDX, USO, DXY, all of these, uh, by the way. Um, and a lot of these signals are now up anywhere between 7% and 30% uh, just in a short week time. Um, and so, uh, I'm, I'm not going to, again, re read every, every last one of those. But here is what I post as a chart every day in the service. Uh, and I do this for all of Avi's longer term count. So here's Avi's longer term count. I believe it's a 60 minute chart for uh, SPX. You can see here that this was from his weekend analysis. Uh, you have the yellow count and you have the green count. Uh, as of this morning, the yellow count in my work had, uh, had a 67% probability versus the green crown of a 33% probability. Now this, you know, this this is not certain. This tells me that if I were, if Bayesian analysis was were presented with this 100 times, 67 times it would lean towards this going yellow, and 33% of the time or 33 times it would lean towards going green. So it's not perfect. It's it's an indicator. It's a lean. It's how you might want to position. It's how you might want to think about things. All right. And keep in mind that this means I'm if I'm going to start putting my hard-earned dollars to work on the yellow count beginning last week even, that there's a 33% chance that I'm wrong and this could backfire on us. Uh, now, we've been very fortunate and the higher probability worked out for us. If you've been following along, you'll see that a lot of times the higher probability, higher probability counts do work out quite well uh, if you are willing to digest and process information and build your trading plans appropriately. All right, so let me move on to another example. Let's do an example from 2019. So 2019 was very challenging. Uh, I'll freely admit, and you can see in the trade table, uh, for the first quarter of 2019, Bayes was uh, was snookered, all right? Got it wrong. Kept trying to short the market, even though it kept pushing up and up and up. And then finally, after a while, Bayesian said, all right, well, I'm supposed to be a learning algorithm. I better start learning. And so beginning around the middle, of the, it, 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 beginning after that first quarter, it started to uh, lean towards this was going to be a bullish run to continue. In fact, from June through February of, uh, of, I'm sorry, this, uh, June to February of 2020, that's a typo, by the way. From June to February, June 9th of 2019 to February 2020, um, uh, that's what started to happen. And you could go back and confirm this. You could go back and look at the, the, the daily thoughts. You could go back and look at the probability assessments. And it started to lean towards Avi's blue count. So basically, generally, June through February of this year, it generally leaned bullish. 
except for, again, you could confirm it by looking at the trade results because the month of October was not very kind to Bayes and we took some losses because we tried to short against that grinding up aspect in the S&P 500. But pretty much otherwise, we did really, really well. We had, we had streaks in there of, uh, of well over 90% for several months of trades, which, which, uh, which actually are on par with some of the best trading I've done uh, with the service. Um, anyway, so you do all this. And so just as an FYI, here's a chart that I went back and I plucked from June 18, 2019. And uh, this was the chart at the time. Avi's primary account was green, which was, which, which was a push back down. This is from June. Uh, the Bayesian work was saying there was a 64% chance that this thing was going to continue higher, which was effectively the bluish count, the higher count. Uh, and, and as we all know, that's what ended up happening. The SP 500 continued to push up and up and up and up and up until February. Um, again, uh, let me give you another example. Here's section two uh, from the BTS, the section two from the BTS. All right, so uh, what you're going to get here is you're going to get more details on the, the specific swing trades with support levels, resistance levels, important timing. Uh, notific uh, windows. And again, I'm not going to read it, but you'll see I have probability assessments. I say this with 31% probability spy stalls out in the 270s and tumbles back to the 210s. 43%, it grinds its way through the 270s and finds 285, 289. Uh, and then 26% 26 spy stalls in the 250s and 270s. All right. So I'll provide little snippets about that. I, I try to take my information and, and, uh, and condense it down to very, very simple uh, sentences for interpretation. Uh, I do the same thing for metals. I do the same thing for oil. I do the same thing for the dollar. All right, so that's late uh, eight every day. And then any extra signals I have open, UNG, for example, uh, was a signal. There wasn't much to add because we got long, and boy, did UNG scream. Gosh, is it up a lot in the last uh, few days here. Uh, GBTC jumped about 17, 20% on us as well. Uh, SMH jumped about 10% on us uh, and what have you. So uh, let me just give you a few examples of what a trade signal might look like so you have some idea of what's going on in the service. So this was, uh, I have a snippet from actual The Daily Thoughts. This was posted The Daily Thoughts before mar market opened on 4-1. And it was also posted on earlier days. It was posted the day before and the day before that as well. But here it goes. I had a steep rate of change. That means a steep rate of change in the probabilities. Uh, so that the, the rate of change of probabilities will also impact a, a signal triggering or not, or not. And so I said, keep an eye on this one. Bottom could be getting close and it could be very explosive. <clears throat> the next day. USO basically had its largest one day and even two day move in its history. So you could call it luck, you could call it trading probabilities, it's up to you. But these are things that are, and I'm just pulling these examples from most recent. I could literally go back for any month for the most part and find very, very, very similar types of anecdotes about this particular uh, trading system. Let me do another one, a jump event. A jump event is a very, very, very fast move, much like a, a, a very abnormal price move. All right, so let me, I'm just going to give you one from a recent event. This was from March 25th, uh, just recently as well. I said, posted in the room, jump events is detected within one to three trading dues. That's a large move uh, with an 80% probability. You can, I'm not going to go read the whole thing. Guess what happened? Within 30 minutes of this post, the Dow dropped 1,000 points in about three minutes. If you remember that day, Bernie Sanders came out in the Senate and said he wasn't going to support such and such. Obviously, I didn't have that information. I, I don't hang out in the Senate. All right. But it just detected something not right in the system. So this is where you place a lottery type of trade uh, or you get a little bit aggressive. This thousand point move has actually been the fastest move since this uh, crash, this, this COVID crash has happened. So I was able to pick that up. Hopefully uh, members were able to lock in fast profits. I even at the end of this jump move, I even posted the jump move is concluded. Um, so, you know, I, I advise taking profits sort of thing. Uh, let's go on to another one, responding to members' posts. So obviously members will ask me questions throughout the day. I'll do my best to then provide assessments or what I'm seeing behind the scenes. So here's an example of this from Benz, uh, K. Benz. I'm guessing he's out of Texas or maybe that's just his initials. Uh, this was a for UNG signal that was already long. And uh, he said, well, waiting for NG to do the same or get in the game, right? Because UN, uh, UNG had, has been sluggish if you've been following that. And I see NG is close. It looks like the tail end shorts trying to get one more micro push lower. That's what I was implying there. The signal was already long. So it wasn't like I was just, uh, uh, you know, saying, hey, maybe you should buy. I said, buy. And then I said with a comment, it looks like it's going to get explosive real quick on us. And guess what happened? The next three days, it jumped 24%. Um, let's see here. Did the BTS call the market top in February 2020? Well, I can only tell you what I've done and I'll tell you what I did wrong. So on February 19th, this is a few days before this crash began, Bayesian probabilities were very bearish and it just wasn't on February 19th. It was literally the two weeks heading into February 19th. Again, go back and confirm it in the daily thoughts if you'd like to. 
But I talked about here, I said, there's an 80% chance that SPY is going to turn down from the upper 330s, which is where it was, and head very sharply back down to 328. And if that didn't hold, it's going to fall down to 315. All right. So uh, that was the assessment of the time. Keep in mind, this was just a grinding up, grinding up, grinding up, very frustrating market, uh, If at least if you were bearish thing fine. And I said, there's a 20% chance that it's going to keep on pushing up forever. All right. And keep in mind, this is supposed to... It's, you could confirm it. So then obviously, you know what happened. The, the market crashed. Uh, we ca when I, I was telling members to get in shorts. We cashed in all our shorts. Now, that was the good part. Here's the bad part. We had the uh, historical crash. And so we got out of our shorts too early. We also had TVIX, by the way, but we got out of our shorts too early. I did try to knife catch two times. Uh, one time I traded around the signal and I led members through that. The other time uh, we took some losses and all that's laid out in the trade table for you. Um, and then since then, so we, we got this short right. We try to catch uh, longs twice. Um, and then I did catch a really nice spy short signal at the end of it and picked up a nice 7% there. And then I've turned around and, uh, and, and actually we, we, you know, we've caught a big chunk of this move off the bottom uh, as well. So, you know, would I say this was an A plus performance? Absolutely not. All right. But I definitely wouldn't fail the performance being that we caught the top on some level. We made some short profits. We made some long mistakes. But we got, but but we definitely have generated profits through a lot of this volatility, and not just this. If you go back and take, I've been trading metals during this. Keep in mind, I got this is. In fact, I may use this example. I got people out of GDX and metals uh, within a day of its crash, blocking in long profits. It crashed. I told you to stay clear of it. We got you back in. We made 11%. Got you back out. Made 11. Made you another 11%. So it's just not applicable to the SPX. All right. So I just want to do a, two more slides, and then I'm going to wrap this up. Um, so there is something known as Boots, and Boots is the Bayesian Elliott Wave trading system. This is an experimental beta, tra beta trading system uh, that I developed with a colleague. Uh, this colleague posts the trades for me because, uh, uh, and I'm very uh, fortunate for him to do so. He goes by the handle of Goose. He didn't want to share his, his full name uh, on, on a website like this, but he goes by Goose. So if you see my name, Luke, but it's signed off Goose, that's actually someone else posting on my behalf. He's, he's one of my colleagues. He works, works with me. Um, but generally, we try to build a 3x ETF trader targeting one to three day holds. Um, the back tested data was very encouraging, looking at uh, returning about 6% per month following a four bucket trading system. There is a guide for this, by the way, you can read through as well. Uh, implemented results uh, between August and February were closer to about 4% per month. Um, so they was underperforming what our back tested results were, but you know, but we're getting some headway. Uh, but the historical volatility in March, the system was not designed for that. Uh, so it basically grounded us and we, we went to a screeching halt uh, uh, about a month ago. We stopped doing trades with that one or maybe a few weeks ago. Uh, again, all this in the trade table. Um, and then what do we got here? And now we've just started up again this week and we're only focused on SPY and that's in the 3X, XPXL and SPXS of that uh, until some of this volatility calms down. So, so uh, that's what Goose is working on. Uh, so keep in mind, it's an experimental trading system. It's offered for free to members, so no additional cost. It's a system that I'm hoping to dial in and then offer to institutional clients if I ever do get it dialed in. Uh, but keep in mind, it's experimental. So I wouldn't be putting 50% of your life savings into it. I mean, I trade it with some of my dollars, but I trade it with experimental dollars. All right. So let me go and start wrapping things up here. Uh, the uh, What did I start with today? I started talking about the Bayesian revision process. I gave you a few examples. I talked about Bayesian price paths. I talked about terminal distributions. I talked about uh, how I am calculating and determining probabilities using uh, this Bayesian process. Uh, I then went on to talk about the uh, BTS and how it's a one to three week swing trading service that uh, since 2007 has performed uh, quite well, quite admirably, I would say. Um, I work uh, with lots of different types of institutions and high net worth clients uh, using a lot of the information that I do present on Elliott, uh, EWT as well. But come in, read the guide, be kind, be professional, because that's how we are in our room. We have a lot of professional traders. We don't fool around. Um, and then come prepare to learn every day because that's my motto for life. I definitely don't know everything. And it fits this Bayesian learning, continuous learning. Let's get better at what we do and work together. And uh, I really hope everyone is out there safe. Uh, with your family and friends, especially given the COVID crisis going on. So, um, Tom, that's all I've got. So I'm going to turn this back over to you. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Luke. And again, we're, we we do have time, so we'd love to welcome up the floor to uh, open the floor the, to questions. We do have a couple that came in, so uh, we'll start with those. And please just go ahead and bring them in. We'll get to as many as we can today. Uh, so, Luke, an interesting uh, question about people noticing the different buckets. Have you done uh, analysis on how the different asset classes perform and is there um, is there 
uh, statistics on maybe say the U.S. market signals are a little bit better or because maybe they're weighted more? Is that what we should assume or is it based on volatility? So what stats are available on that and what can you talk about each of the, the different buckets? Excellent, excellent question. So uh, the weighting are actually a function of volatility. So all we're really doing are trading instruments and securities and we're, and we're allocating them as a function of volatility. I could be trading baseball cards. It doesn't really matter, right? I'm evaluating uh, 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 projected price paths and then, and then placing trades based off probability. So the weighting there is more a function of volatility than it is accuracy of the system. But it's a very insightful question. In terms of general accuracy for each one of the buckets, they're all about the same. They are all performing uh, between 70 to 80 uh, percent. UNG, uh, I'll be honest, uh, that one's kind of that one's kind of hit or miss. I've even uh, considered maybe pulling that one out of the bucket, um, uh, but um, you know, you get a huge win like we have now, it makes up for for losses in the past. I've also posted actually natural gas stock trades uh, in the past, and actually those signals did really well over two weeks. Those stocks performed between 27 and I believe 57 percent. So, but great question. Uh, the the weighting is a, a function of volatility, not uh, not bucket success. Fantastic. So, do you find that the signals work better in a certain type of market, specifically either a trending market or a, a whippy market, one that is going uh, back and forth, up and down? That's also another great question. I've also tried to go back and filter for that. In all honesty, statistically speaking, there isn't that much of a difference. Uh, and uh, and 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 we could again go back and confirm this. Go back and look at the very chopping time period uh, late summer. You see the market was basically bouncing uh, between two price points, and it did so for about a month and a half. We went 90% during that time frame, which actually shocked me. I didn't, I hadn't anticipated doing that well in such a choppy market. And then we've had some tre trending markets where uh, the BTS has completely got it wrong. So we'll go back to early 2019 when it kept trying to short this bullish V-shaped recovery that never let up. Um, so, you know, you, you kind of get a mix of both. Uh, I just can tell you historically the data is indicating uh, a similar performance uh, across ETFs and, and markets. During the presentation, you did show a, you know, an example of how you're, you're available in the room to answer questions from members. And you also alluded to the fact of, of maybe additional signals, especially during this uh, just crazy time that we're in, and, and during the just really the the increased uh, movement that we're seeing in the market. Maybe could you just talk just a, a little bit more about what you also try to do in addition to the signals to keep members abreast of what you're seeing, especially as we're seeing outsized moved in the markets, and and what else you might try to do uh, to help them navigate these markets. Fantastic question. So, uh, so the other buckets are basically set up to kind of use standard things like SMH and XBI. So, which are actually two active signals we have now, and they are technically part of the other bucket. But I also have GBTC, which would technically be an other as well. I also have FCG right now presently. So, I really have four other signals going on right now. Uh, technically, I would prefer to keep that to ten, but people like to trade things like Bitcoin, which basically GBTC is a proxy for. Um, so I'll basically say, and, and like with the FCG signal, for example, this time, I even labeled it in the trade signal bonus signal. And you could do generally whatever you, whatever you want one with it. Um, uh, but uh, in terms of trying to guide members' hands, uh, what I generally try to do is check in. Uh, um, uh, just like you guys, a lot of you guys are full-time uh, uh, doing your careers and you, and you trade when you can. Uh, I'm very busy as well, which is why I've actually brought Goose in. Um, and he's an, he's, you know, he, he's, an, he's an expense to me. I brought this in to help you guys. Okay. Um, uh, but you know, I, I am very busy. I'm a tenured finance professor. I have a full-time lecture schedule, uh, when we're in session. And I also, uh, do travel quite a bit meeting with a, a whole range of clients all over the country and even world. Uh, so I, when I am available in front of the screen, I'm providing tips and hints. I try to have a closeout note for the day on things to keep an eye for, eye out for. Like today, I said, all signals still long and strong. Uh, those sorts of things. If if members have questions, uh, then feel free to post it in the room, and uh, I I promise you I'll get around to it. Sometimes it's not till three in the morning, but I'll get there. Uh, and if not, a lot of times other members will jump in and answer questions because we have a lot of members that have been here since day one, uh, and they've they've learned how to incorporate the BTS into what it is they already do for a career. So for the portion where you're providing analysis on on Avi's charts, or I'm sorry, probabilities on Avi's charts. This may just also be a little bit more anecdotal, but over the time that you've been doing this, how often do you feel it's more a third, two third or more? And how often does it kind of trend more towards a, maybe a 50-50? Okay, great question. Um, 
what you'll find is uh, when you're speaking in probabilities, right? No one has a crystal ball. So rarely, rarely, rarely will you see an 80% probability for one or the other. So when I got that 80% in late February, I was pretty confident that the market was going to fall. Did I think it was going to fall like it did? No, I, I, you know, of course not. Who, who could have guessed uh, that sort of thing? But, uh, but usually the probabilities will range between, uh, you know, like let's, we'll just pick one of them, like 50% up to maybe 75%. That's usually where you'll see. And the other will obviously be one minus that. Um, in terms of what I'm seeing with Avi, um, uh, you know, this time I happen to, uh, to, to, dis to disagree with Avi. Disagree is a strong word. I wouldn't say I disagree. I would simply say the probabilities based off the, the sampling data that I gather merged with Avi's analysis is indicating to me that higher is in order before lower, okay? So whether that's a corrective pullback or a retest of the lows, uh, but generally it tells me that higher is probably favored. And now keep in mind, what I'm doing with my Bayesian work isn't pure Bayesian, so I mean, I'm sorry, isn't pure Elliott wave, all right? So what that means is I'm not necessarily uh, uh, determining the entire price path of what, of what Avi's generating. I'm, I'm doing my best to overlay my Bayesian probability assessment on where he thinks price path is going to be uh, at different moments in time. So um, I, I, this may be a long-winded way to, to answer your question. Uh, look for probabilities to range between 50 and 75%. Um, and, uh, and, and I agree with Avi lots of times. Like a lot of the times our probabilities align with one another, all right? And he's saying this is his primary and Bayesian is saying that's the primary. And you know, I start to get pretty confident when I see that, especially then I get the, the trade signals also agreeing with that. You know, I, I start to get confident. I mean, I don't like to to uh, to have a different uh, uh, a primary than Avi, but I but I'm a probability person. I'm a data person, and that's all I'm doing, and that's all I'm trading. It's like, it's like if you were going to go play uh, Texas Hold'em or blackjack at the casino, you're going to bet based off of the information set that you have in front of you, and you're gonna you become a probability machine in how you bet. And I just effectively apply that same analogy to how I'm uh, placing my trades in the markets. Just a really quick follow up to what you said, because it does uh, touch upon a question that we did get. So when they come into the service, when if users decide to come into the service, really the only charts that they're going to see inside the Bayesian service is obvious charts. Is that right? You're, you're not really providing analysis on charts. You're, you're providing more of a statistical output and then trade signals around that if they add that service. Yeah, that's a great question. So the only charts that I am providing are obvious charts. So I am, pre I am pre uh, uh, preparing uh, Bayesian analysis of Avi's charts. In terms of the BTS itself, it's a discussion uh, uh, only. And so I will I will have a discussion uh, around those price paths. I also have Bayesian only long-term charts, uh, but uh, as as I've kind of alluded to, um, I have obligations outside of Elliott Wave. Uh, and as you can imagine, if an institution uh, has an interest in, in some of these things, um, uh, you know, it's a different type of relationship. And it and it 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 does kind of handcuff me a bit on everything that I can kind of share on a on a on a public site like like EWT. But generally, the only charts you're going to see are um, are obvious charts, and everything else is going to be discussion oriented. However, you do get very clearly defined signals. There is no wishy washiness. There is only buy USO at 9:52 a.m. 17 seconds. Buy at four dollars and 21 cents. That's what you're going to get. Um, and, uh, and I think that I'm, I'm hoping that that is value added to our members. I know we don't want to spend too much time on, on what I'll call the tails, uh, but you did mention during your presentation that there can be trades that, um, fall much shorter than that expected, um, uh, hold period. And also that can go much longer just out of curiosity. Is it that, um, so the Bayesian system is looking at that, that same, whatever that equity was, whatever that ETF that it is, and it's looking again out 10 days and deciding that it's it's likely going to be able to exit that position at a better price projected out 10 days? That's very insightful uh, a question for you, Tom, or whoever posted that one. Yeah, so uh, I've, I've studied why why I get stuck, right? So or why Bayesian gets stuck. Um, I'm not always just looking 10 days. I mean, you know, I, I use that as an example. I mean, I, I, I'm calculating... Uh, one day out, two days out, three days out, four days out. I mean, all the way up to a month out, right? Um, and so that, that's what happens, though. Basically, it gets into like with UNG. I was stuck in UNG for like over a year. And what happened with UNG is an extremely volatile instrument. Um, when it does have price spikes, uh, the volatility of those price spikes can be massive. If you've ever traded the Widowmaker, you know what I'm talking about. It'll basically bleed off, bleed off, bleed off, drop 20%, let's say, and then have a 17% price, price spike over a week. 
And so what that what I found is for those highly volatile instruments, what's going on is this, the system gets misled thinking, oh, well, that's an impulsive new uptrend. And then it resets its its timing window. Um, and then UNG just goes off to bleeding all forever again. Um, and so, you know, I, I, these are things that I work on, right? I haven't built a perfect system. I'm happy to admit that. Trade results are all itemized for you. Um, uh, and, and UNG happens to be one of those really, really tricky signals to trade. Uh, the, I, you know, the, uh, um, the biggest miss in my book recently wasn't even this free fall we're in now. I mean, think about it. Most people who are long only investors are down 30%, let's say. I mean, the BTS isn't down anywhere near that uh, over, the, over the last month. Um, uh, in fact, you can go back and look at the results. With, the, with our most recent current signals, we're actually up uh, using the optimal portfolio. Um, but anyway, um, um, for me, it was it was a 2019 market rebound. It was that V-shaped recovery. Uh, if I'm going to kick myself over anyone, that was the one I was most disappointed about. So I went back and I dissected and studied that as much as possible. And so hopefully I don't get caught by that V-shaped again, which could be one reason why I may have caught this most recent move. I'm not saying we're V-shaping right now and the market could pull back even more tomorrow. I, I noticed what happened today. It pulled back intraday. Um, but uh, but maybe it learned something from er, from first quarter 2019 and said, you know what, let's give that aggressive V shape a little bit more thought than we would have normal otherwise. Uh, but but good question, thanks, Tom. Just a um, and I understand you may, we didn't have this in advance, so you may not have these statistics. But if you have any anecdotal comments, it just in terms of the per past performance that you mentioned, uh, both from the 2007 when you started uh, utilizing the Bayesian. Uh, uh, timing method, and then also from the start of EWT. Do you have a, a reference of how many of the signals were longs versus shorts? And have you ever looked, so part two, at um, you know what the performance would be if someone, for whatever reason, uh, maybe wants it as a long only option? Oh, that's a great question. You know, that I actually had that question in the room maybe about a year and a half ago, and I went back and I I tried to uh, ascertain that to the best of my ability. Um, and in all honesty, I, I wasn't able to, to get a, a clear answer, unfortunately. So what that meant is um, I, it generally did better on long signals, but did it, did, so, did it do so in such a magnitude that you should ignore all those short signals? I would generally say no. Um, but if you want to use it as a, as a long only, I mean, and, and keep in mind, right? I mean, the, United, the U.S. markets are generally, uh, historically, have been in a bull market type mindset. Even, you know, even with the crashes, generally, you know, uh, you know you, you're, you're, you're generally betting against a history when you, when you become a chronic short seller. Um, so generally, and, and so when I basically remove the effects and normalize the effects the, uh, the, the, in, in terms of that uh, two thirds of the time the U.S. markets are up anyway, um, I, I really couldn't find an edge for a long versus short, but that's a very insightful question. Thanks for asking it. So um, in terms of something that you mentioned, uh, this being, say, a learning-based system, how, how much of this is uh, that, that Bayesian is, the Bayesian uh, timing system is, is learning on its own, and how much is it you kind of mentioned going in and working at the data and looking to see if there's maybe a, a larger reset that you're going to put into it. How does that kind of just go happen? And, and That's a fantastic question. So when I go back and I look at it, I'm really trying to see if there's any glaring holes. Generally, the Beijing system is an iterative learning process. So I'm, I mean, if I wanted to go back and just tweak, a, it would be difficult to do. So let's say I went back to an iteration and, and, and tweaked it. So you know how like some people build trading systems and then and then it gets it wrong for a while. Then they go back and back test it, and then they change their rules, and then they massage this. And oh, look, my my, my system would have done such and such, you know. And they're always tweaking the rules based off of a most recent data set. Like in my opinion, that's not really how you should go about back testing a system. A system, uh, you know, it, it needs needs to to stand on its own merits. Um, and and obviously, the, the longer the system's been in place, uh, the, the more. Uh, the more concrete you can feel in its results. So let's say, but let's just say that I went back and I and I wanted to tweak an iteration. So I go back, I tweak an iteration, and I and I develop some uh, some heuristic based off the most recent data set. And I go back and I tweak an iteration. What's going to happen is that iteration that was tweaked uh, it becomes an a priori, which becomes a posterior. That posterior becomes an a priority. And guess what? The process is going to eventually, uh, I guess you could say, massage that tweak out of it anyway. So in terms of hardline tweaks that basically alter the entire path of, of what I'm doing with Bayesian, I really haven't had any. I mean, the system's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, what I've done here, I wouldn't say, I mean, I, I've cured any cancers. All I've really done is taken an existing Bayesian statistical decision process, which has been around for decades, by the way, and option pricing theory 
and price path information and things that people have been doing anyway, right? Um, but what I've done is I think I found maybe a novel or unique way to bring them all together is really what I've done. Um, and so I'm, I'm using uh, processes and methodologies that are proven, have been proven for decades. Um, I've just maybe found a creative way to, to incorporate them and merge them and have them communicate with one another that maybe not a lot of other people are, are looking at. Um, um, so yeah, good question though. No, that's a fantastic answer. And I actually want to follow up on that a little bit because I do believe we have some people on here that maybe have either uh, been very familiar with other based, you almost maybe call them mechanical type systems where then trade signals are being kicked out. So um, just to clarify for, for them and for myself, it, we didn't go back, you didn't go back to that that. Um, that V bottom in, in 2018, late 2018, early 2019, this isn't a situation where when you said you went back and looked at it, this was not a curve fitting situation where you started to alter your methodology based on that to try to catch it again. This is, um, this is just more looking at how it, uh, how the bottom happened, what Bayes was looking at and seeing if there's anywhere that you could find a hole that could be patched. Absolutely. I mean, basically, I'm looking to learn. My motto for life is continuous learning. And so that's what I encourage in my children. That's what I encourage in my students. That's what I encourage in my clients. So there is no wholesale. I mean, for me to wholesale tweak uh, the Bayesian system um, would be we would be building an entirely new system. Bayesian is effectively a priori sampling data posterior, a priori sampling data posterior. Uh, so could I possibly tweak some of the inputs that go into it? But yeah, I, I could but I'm collecting over 50 different indicators. So, I, I mean, could I throw in another three? Uh, yes, would that marginally maybe improve something with a tweak looking in the past? It could, but I, I believe in the iterative process and if it did anything, it would be so marginal that it wouldn't even really matter anyway. I think this is probably the best analogy for why I went back and looked at uh, what I would say my biggest miss over the last several years, and that was last year, um, was, uh, was the following. I went to the University of Virginia undergraduate. I follow March Madness and basketball. UVA, a couple of years ago, was the number one seed in the tournament, the number one seed in the whole thing, right? And they lost to a 16 seed in round one, right? That's a huge miss. You don't think that that coach went back and watched that tape to figure out if there were any glaring holes or huge misses or something that just didn't make any sense? I mean, the probability of that V-shaped recovery last year, in my opinion, was about as slim as a 16 seed beating a one seed, which has never happened by the way before. So as a coach, I'm gonna go back and take a look at that and see if I missed anything glaring or or, or, or maybe there's something wrong with my system. And, and I'm happy to admit that if I find it, but I have an iterative learning process uh, that's continually in gathering and, and incorporating new information. So um, I still feel confident with it. I still trade with it. I have more institutional clients today than I had three years ago. Um, so, um, I have Bayesian members that have been with, been with me since day one. So, I mean, it's not perfect. If you're going to come in here and I'm going to give you, you know, let's say I, I give you a spy signal or a UNG signal and you take your life savings, you buy a three TX, three X ETF based off that one signal and you blow yourself up. Um, then I kind of view that as your fault, not mine. I'm not encouraging you to do it. I'm encouraging you to be diversified. I'm encouraging you to follow the bucket system. I'm encouraging you, uh, to, to take this slow. Warren Buffett averages 22% a year. It's slow, all right? And, and I built a swing trading system that encourages you to take it slow. I, I think members have gotten frustrated because they come in uh, and, and, and they get overconfident uh, in one signal and they over leverage, they overexpose, and it doesn't work out for them. Um, but uh, generally, if you follow the guidebook um, uh, with the diversification and the fact that I recommend going to cash um, uh, you know, it, for certain time periods, you know, it, 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 it helps control the FOMO. It helps build a system for yourself. And even if you don't use every single trade signal, you probably have your own trade uh, uh, systems you've developed. So think about how maybe the probabilities might help you with that. Or think about how a trade signal might help you provide confidence one way or the other if you want to take a trade. So, you know, there are lots of ways that our members utilize the signals. Some of them use it as a pure mechanical service. Some of them only utilize uh, the, the U.S. indice. Some only utilize GDX. Uh, some, you know, some of them just uh, uh, like to see generally what's going on with Bayesian and incorporate those leanings into their work too. So it's a, it's really a mix of, of any and all of that. That's, this is fantastic. And I know we I, on with us today, which is, is really wonderful. We have both members and non-members. So I, I believe members are really enjoying this because we don't often uh, get a chance to stop. And even though a lot of this is included in the guide, sometimes hearing it, 
um, is really such so refreshing and, and maybe brings it more full circle. What you know, one other comment because we're just kind of on this topic. I believe you said that to trigger a signal, um, there needed to be a seventy-five percent threshold reached. Um, is that correct. Is, that's correct? Okay. Is that ever something that you've looked at? Um, and just when you're when you're doing these periods of times and you're doing these reviews, um, is that something where if maybe I I dropped it to a seventy percent, I I might have gotten a signal off of a, a V bottom? Is that just out of just actually more curiosity and in, in understanding your process? Oh, brilliant! Gosh, uh, that's one reason I really like uh, work with with, with uh, EWT members. I get the most insightful questions. In fact, that's one reason why I do it. I mean, uh, I, it's the opportunity to learn, to see how other people's minds work, to get feedback like this. So let me answer this question for you, because I actually have looked at this uh, as well. Um, if I were to drop the signal to a 70%, I would pick up more signals, but I would also pick up some more losers. And it turns out that the weighted average losses by going from a 75 to a 70% aren't worth the effort. I've also even tried to increase the signal to an 80% accuracy. I'm going to get more right, but I'm not going to take enough signals. So it turns out if I push it too high into the 80s, uh, then I will, I'll be sitting out a lot. And, and, and sometimes that's okay, but if I sit out uh, good runs long or short, then, then I don't want that either. So generally, I find that around 75% uh, is, quote unquote, the optimal trigger point for my system. And the historical data kind of, kind of uh, pro, you know, is a proof of that. I mean, uh, you know, again, go look at the trade table in, in Elliott Wave. It's, it's in the 70 to 80% range. Um, and, um, and if I go back and look at all my data, it's the same thing. But a good question. I mean, if I were to manually tweak anything, like that's something that, that I could do. So someone asked a question earlier, if I were to try to go back and, and force the system somehow. If I did that, I, I, I could manually tweak it and push it one way or the other. Um, I don't do that. I haven't done that, but I definitely back tested around that to try to, to try to answer that exact question. And I think kind of what you were uh, <laughs> discussing with er earlier is that by not doing that, we understand we're maybe taking a few more signals, um, but also to to avoid just be sitting here on our hands waiting for signals. And this is where the waiting really comes in and the waiting. And, and then, as you mentioned, you know, members can pick and choose what they prefer and what they think is best for them. But you've taken the time to go over and actually reference what you see as the most optimal waiting um, uh, based on the buckets and based on the volatility that goes along with those buckets. So you're diversifying across the buckets and then you're even diversifying inside of those buckets. That's exactly right. So I'll, I'll go back, uh, uh, you know, um, to one of the knife catches most recently, okay? So we were short from the market top. We got a nice return, went, got it way too early. My gosh, when, how awesome would, and I'll be honest, if I, with the positions that I had, if I had held all the way to uh, from 340-ish uh, spy all the way down to 220-ish spy, uh, I like you guys, but I don't think I'd be here. I'd be like retired and own an island. Um, so obviously I didn't do that. Of course I would have loved to have done that, right? But I didn't. Um, but we caught a nice short. I did try to knife catch. Um, but you know, let's say the knife catch goes wrong. All right. And, uh, and the knife catch uh, for one of the knife catches that went wrong was for about, I think about a spy loss of 7% or 8%. I, it's all in the trade table. I, I could go look at it. You could too. Um, but keep in mind that I'm only exposed to 16% of my portfolio in spy and I had spy QQQ and IWM open. So that's a 42% uh, exposure to those, uh, to those ETFs. So that's 42% that I'm losing, let's say 8% on. Okay. So uh, it's not like I lost my entire portfolio. Keep in mind that my metals positions during that same time frame, I locked in a nice win on the long side, and then boom, I went to cash for that entire free fall. What a, what a historic free fall in metals that was. Imagine actually holding through that. That would have been horrific. So uh, I was sitting in cash, and, and that bucket represents 26% of my portfolio. So 26% of my portfolio, after locking in a nice win, sat there in cash, didn't lose any money, didn't do anything. Once things settled a bit, boom, we were right back in and we had some really nice metals wins. In fact, 100% metals wins over the last uh, several weeks uh, after that free fall. So 100% um, in terms of uh, success rate, uh, but, but some really good returns in there. So yeah, I, you know, and, and so that's kind of how I view it. I mean, uh, you know, the, the energy stuff is really tricky. So, uh, uh, so uh, you know, USO and UNG can be very tricky, but they're only five and 7% of the portfolio. So you know, even even if I'm wrong, 30% on UNG, uh, it's only going to lower my portfolio value one and a half percent, right? 30% times uh, five uh, uh, times 0.05. So I, I it, this system's uh, been back tested. It's robust. It's trying to protect traders uh, from over allocating, staying diversified, and staying in the game. It's all about staying in the game, all right? And then every now and then, if you want to press based off my probability price path assessments, boom, that's where your extra return comes from. Um, but generally, 
this keeps you in the game. It keeps you diversified. It keeps you active. It puts you in cash when the probabilities indicate you should be in cash. And and I and 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 here's why I say that probabilities tell me that I don't have enough information to really make an informed uh, trade. So it tells me to stay on the stay. It doesn't mean this. It doesn't mean that the, the market's not going to go up or down a lot. It just tells me I don't have enough information to trade. Um, and I and you know and and and, and sometimes. Being in cash is a position and it's very valuable to have that dry powder. Do you find that the trades somewhat cluster um, that maybe if if uh, if if Bayes is getting, let's say, a, a signal for the S&P that it's likely that the other majors will trigger as well or do they deviate? No, that's a great question. Uh, they do have a tendency to cluster. Um, if, if, if I, I do, I've written quite a bit on this in the room. So I've, I'm, I studied markets and, and been studying market for almost two decades now. Um, generally, here's how I view IWM and QQQ. They are just volatile versions of SPY. That's all they are. Um, and, and, you know, yeah, you know, people point out to intraday, well, IWM is doing this or is doing that. I mean, it's just more volatile and it's going to move around slightly different than SPY will. So generally, if the if spy is going to trigger, generally the other two will trigger. There obviously have been times in the past where only spy will trigger, or let's say maybe QQQ will only trigger and the other ones won't. But generally, they do have a tendency to cluster. Yes. Uh, one question. So we we do see the other bucket, and I was just curious because you also mentioned that you you give other signals. Um, so there may be some items that are put out that aren't don't fully mesh. Uh, I'm sorry, aren't fully listed. I shouldn't say mesh. Aren't fully listed. Is there any um, item that you actually treat as, uh, you know, very secondary, which should be either limited below any of the percentages we see here, um, or or maybe even just strongly consider that maybe it's not something uh, that people should consider. Something like along the lines of, you know, is there? I guess is there any ETF that you cover, like maybe one of the VIX that you have oh, yeah. special rules for? Absolutely. Um, and so I do post this in the room whenever I post a VXX. VXX is extraordinarily volatile. I only recommend a 3% uh, weight assignment to VXX because of its volatility. Um, uh, I think that's the only one that I, that I really do that for, actually. So uh, any of the VXX trades uh, are, are a very, very, very small position, uh, just given the extraordinary volatility associated with those. Uh, the other ones, uh, you know, generally 10% will work. Um, you know, uh, you know, it, you know it, keep in mind that... that um, that I walk the talk, right? I mean, I I I am in laying in and and bed with you guys. I mean, I post a buy spy signal. Guess what I'm doing? I'm buying. I'm allocating. I'm doing everything that I'm talking about. All right. Um, what what you might not see when I'm doing is how I trade around the signal. So uh, you know, a lot of times I'll work. In fact, that you know, it's, it, it reminded me. So when a signal goes active, I and it's mentioned in the guide, I recommend averaging into a signal over three at a minimum three tranches. And so you can do, you can maybe go a third. So let's say that um, IWM were to trigger, all right? So uh, if I were to divide that by three, that's 4%. So if IWM triggered, I would put $4,000 to work right away on the signal trigger, all right? The other 8,000 or the rest of that allocation, I would, I would be patient, all right? I don't hold people's hands in this regard though, because uh, it would be extraordinarily time consuming, but generally I'm patient, all right? And, uh, and, 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 if, and, and sometimes I'm patient over time. So if the market's in a trading range, I'll kind of maybe average in over the next several days. Uh, if the market's very, very volatile and moves very quickly against me, I actually view that as a good thing. If I get in, if, I, if IWN triggers, let's say at 100, all right, and it drops to 95, I'm actually happy because I've, I've got a third of my position at 100. I get to get more at 95 and like it even better. It drops to 92, I like it even better. Now I'm averaged in, let's say maybe around 96. I'm a much better average in price. Now, of course, if it goes into free fall, the, the system will automatically trigger a stop. And yeah, we'll take a loss in that situation. But a lot of times, and we know that historically, 70 to 80% of the time, the, 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 the trigger is going to be positive. That's what it's done historically. Go look at the trade table. Um, and so I'm, I feel confident holding even through, through downdrafts. Again, it's not perfect, though. That still means 20, 30% of the time it's going to go against you. So generally, I average in positions um, and, I, and I try to uh, allocate. I don't, I don't explicitly talk about how I trade around the signals. I, I did do that uh, on one of the knife catch um, uh, uh, attempts um, uh, over the last month or so, uh, which I thought I was doing a good job posting, um, but I, I guess I wasn't. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to admit that I, I wasn't able to post the trades in the trade table because the trade table is set up all around this 10 bucket system. So I wasn't able to micro trade by posting in the trade table. So I was trying to guide members utilizing the comment section 
Um, and I think some members were able to pick up on it very easily. And some members, I think, got frustrated by it. I wasn't trying to frustrate anyone. I was just simply trying to help. I was like, look, this is historic free fall. I'm going to help you trade around the signal to try to minimize the damage, maybe even make a profit. And, and, and I was able to make a profit, even though the signal uh, was negative. And some members that were able to follow were as well. But, but, but I wasn't, you know, I was only trying to help. And so uh, given the fact that some members seem to be very frustrated uh, with that assistance on my part, I'm, I'm not going to try to micro trade uh, uh, with members at, 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 on, those, on that line anymore. I'd rather you guys ha try to have a tradable system that speaks for itself. The results speak for itself. Um, I'm happy to answer a bunch of questions around it. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't think we're going to, I hope we're not going to have any more COVID related historic free falls in the future. Um, and I don't, I mean, I don't anticipate we will. How many black swan events can we have in 10 years? Um, all right. So I hope we answered your question. The, uh, so one of the, the trade signals that you provided an example of did happen to mention that, you know, for the, at that time, stop w was zero. So if, if you could just maybe to talk a little bit about how Bayes handles hard stops first, then um, exiting signals and, and how just that process works um, as much as you can oh, share. Absolutely. It's discussed in the trader's guide, but I'm happy to, to mention it here. Uh, so uh, uh, stops are explicitly worked into the Bayesian trade signal. So I don't normally list hard stops. So if we get in USO at 421, I will have in the daily thoughts, well, $4, if it breaks $4, that could be bad. Um, but the Bayesian system, I let it do its thing. I let it iterate. I let it learn. I let it tell me that it looks like this isn't going to recover. Because um, historically, it's worked out for me to do that. Um, now, sometimes I will actually list a hard stop. So I would say... 10, 20% of the time, I'll list a hard stop uh, for, for a position. Otherwise, I just wait for the signal to go to neutral. So if I'm, if I'm long and the position moves against me, uh, then I will go to the sidelines or basically stop out. Once the signal goes to neutral, I'll go back to cash. Um, but I, I usually rely on the probabilities to tell me, tell me that. Um, I, and let me give you a recent example. Again, I'm just trying to pick recent examples for those. UNG, I mean, my gosh, what a difficult instrument to trade, right? So uh, it triggered uh, middle of last week. What does UNG do every single time uh, anyone buys it? It goes straight down. That's, that's what the Widowmaker does. So the signal triggered. I, I picked up a third of what I wanted to pick up right away. It dropped against me. I picked up another third. It dropped again on me. I think it dropped like 6 or 7% within two trading sessions. Uh, I was able to average in as it went down. Then Kay Benz, uh, uh, uh posted his thing. I was really analyzing and studying it. And I said, boy, it sure looks like it's going to turn. And it did turn and it moved 24%. That full 24% off the bottom, that first six or 7% was just me getting back to break even on that signal, um, which is not ideal, right? Of course, we all wanna just get a signal and make money right away. We all just wanna make a million dollars instantly. That'd be awesome, but it doesn't work that way. So uh, anywhere in the real world when it comes to markets. So anyway, that first 6% was just me getting my money back. Actually, I was averaged in, so I actually had a little better price. And then, and then it's been gravy on top of that. So what I'm getting at is, you know, I can sense some frustration sometimes from members because they say, well, buy. And, and, and in their mind, they're thinking it's an intraday service. It's like, like Ricky. He does an excellent job. I think all the analysts are great. I think you should try all their services. Um, but, you know, Ricky does this intra intraday trading of, of, of ES, right? I mean, when you, you know, and he's good at it, right? Check him out if you haven't checked it out. But and he says buy, right? And then, like, you need to see that thing move in that direction almost instantaneously. Obviously, he puts some stops in. But it's a different type of expectation. If the BTS says buy, you almost want to view it as uh, the winds are a changing, right? Like you've got some bearish winds, all right? Signal says buy. That tells me that, all right, things are setting up for a turn here. Maybe I should start positioning for that turn. It's more like I'm driving a Mack truck, like kind of taking the turns nice and slow and easy as we're turning this thing around. And Ricky, great service, is more like driving a Ferrari or a Porsche. Right, he's got to get that thing whip around right away because he's doing those intraday signals in and out and, and riding the train and all that sort of stuff. It's exciting. I like to read his post when I have time. So you know, hopefully that perspective helps a little bit. Um, uh, you get a signal trigger. Uh, Fifty per again, I, I quantified this. About fifty percent of the time, the market will uh, generally respond like a Ferrari, and about fifty percent of the time, based off the signal, it's going to be that slow Mack truck turn. And and uh, yeah, trust me, that can get very frustrating. And especially if you're wrong, you're doing a slow Mac turn. It's going against you, um, and uh, and and it, it's the nature it's the nature of the beast. Um, uh, and 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 for those of you guys that are professional traders or investors, I, I think you probably have some perspective for that. Um, and and that's one thing that I really respect about our group. I I rarely get the 
you know, the whiny types in the room, which, which is fantastic, right? I mean, I notice sometimes people get frustrated and they, they take those out. But, you know, our group is, is very professional, very kind. Uh, obviously, some frustrations here and there, but for the most part, uh, it, it, you're, it's a fun group to work with, and, and I'm happy to continue doing it. That's great. And I, we've gone well over. So I, I do want to get to to two more things. One should be just a quick one. You, you know, you took the time to mention this is great about the scaling into a position. Do you um, suggest or or have you ever looked at at the same time when that position then gets closed? Do you consider scaling out of it or for, for you is the closing a little bit more immediate? Uh, great question. Very insightful. Um, there are, there are several ways that I personally go about doing it. So when you get the real time neutral signal, you're close. That means at least for the trade tables perspective, you close at that, you close it out at that position. Uh, I'm sorry, at that price point. Um, what I do in practice is, yeah, I'll scale out. I mean, especially if I sense, I mean, you know, people that trade have a general sense when, when like, you know, the bulls on a full on charge or the bears are on a full on rampage. Right. So, um, you know, I, I, uh, I, you kind of have, you know, so for me, I, uh, uh, when I scale out, I'll scale out a third right away, all right? And then uh, if it's an obvious bull charge, which you kind of know when that's going to happen, or the short squeeze late in the day, Mike, how many times as you see a short squeeze like the last hour? You know it's there, right? You, you know it's going to happen. Um, so a lot of times I'll wait to, for, for those types of moments. Some, so there's some subjectivity getting out as there is uh, getting in. Um, but, uh, 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 but, and, and I've even had members, and, and it's a good idea, they start setting trailing stops. So like the signal will trigger and what they'll then do is start setting a trailing stop and then trail it up until they get, until they get stopped out. So uh, again, um, you know, my service uh, is, is um, it, it, I, ha I handle as much as I possibly can, uh, given that, given how complex the system is. I mean, there's lots of signals, there's lots of stuff going on. Um, so, uh, and, and, and I do my best to handle as much as possible, but, but there's a lot of experience in the room and, and they all have their, their, their kind of uh, the ways that they, that they massage in and out of their, uh, uh, the positions as well. No, oh, that's a fantastic insight. And then just, just one more quick one while we're staying right on this topic. If you found that a signal started to maybe, uh, so it, it triggers a lot, let's just say a long, it triggers a long and you've got in for your initial tranche. Um, is there a point where you then would not consider averaging up? So let's say that does actually pluck some form of, of relative bottom. Um, is there a, just for, even if again, it's anecdotal, not necessarily statistical in the, in the guide, is there a point where you start to say, Ooh, I'm not going to average up on this anymore. You know, I'll just sit with whatever percentage I got in. Oh, that's a great question as well. Uh, uh if it moves really, really fast. Yeah. I just view it as, look, I wanted to have a uh, 12,000 in that IWM, but I got four, you know, and it's gone. Uh, bye run for us, run, you know, I mean, uh, you know, and I'll just be happy with my 4,000 that's allocated. Uh, but, you know, if you think about impulsive waves and what you learn from Avi and all the excellent waves on, on EWT, you know, you want to see that impulsive wave and then you want to see a corrective pullback. So I would encourage you to merge, you know, in, in, your, in your trading behaviors, because I do. If we get an impulsive run, I'll watch it run with what I have allocated. And then if it is a corrective pullback, you know, and then a lot of times I can go look at maybe EWT's uh, <coughs> analyst um, uh, chart, for example, on that. And then I will buy on pullbacks. So um, uh, I don't always let it run. Uh, if it runs really fast, and 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 uh, then then in the, in the trigger uh, the, the trigger uh, uh, comes along for the signal, then I'll just get out with a partial position. Otherwise, I'll wait to get in. Um, and if and if the market doesn't pull back or doesn't pull back correctively, uh, then then so be it. And, and that's the nature of it sometimes. But you know, keep in mind a lot of these signals will kind of trigger around the same time. So if IWM triggered, probably QQQ and SPY did as well. So you probably have, you know, a decent allocation if you were to buy a third of all of them right out of the gate. Um, and then, you know, do your best to try to pick your way in after the fact, especially if, it, if it's aggressively uh, moving in your favor, but you don't have the allocation that you want. Yeah, so I, I am noticing a couple questions. Uh, so maybe this would be a good topic to go about. Um, obviously, you've built this model and you're, you're showing it very transparently and at least to, to the degree that... You know, there's some secret sauce there, of course, as well. But um, so people are talking about deviating off the signals, um, both with options. There's some questions about using options. And then there's also some questions about in something like with the US or the UNG um, using the commodity. Um, is that just, that just something you have any general comments about um, or caveats or anything that you could share for, for those attending? Absolutely. Um, 
Uh, so first off, yeah, I mean, obviously, USO is an ETF that, you know, it, it does it well, and it's an ET, ET, ETN, I believe, but but basically, it's working with futures contracts, right? So make sure you understand what's going on there. UNG, same thing, right? You're going to you're gonna have some slippage um, uh, given uh, given that relationship between the ETF and the actual uh, the actual contracts themselves. Um, but uh, generally, yeah, you know, if, if the USO triggers and you want to trade oil uh, oil futures, you're generally going to see comparable results. Um, uh, you know, you're going to have to do a little bit more work, right? Because USO will does the rebalancing for you, and if you, you you've got to roll one way, uh, then you, you know you're going to have to be familiar and comfortable with doing that. Um, but uh, but generally, yes, you you can you can utilize the ETF to trade uh, ES as well. I know some people just uh, will trade the ES based off SPY. Now, obviously, ES trades. Uh, 24 hours a day, uh, you know, five days a week. But uh, but yeah, during market hours, I know I do have uh, people that do trade ES based off the spy signal. Um, and same thing with UNG trading natural gas. Um, in terms of options, this is what I would add for this. Keep in mind that 80% of, of the signals are targeting one to three week hold periods. That means 20% of the time they're going to be a lot less or a lot longer. So, um, you know, it's not always going to get the timing component. And with options, as, uh, as you guys that are more experienced know, boy, timing is such a critical component of options. Uh, I, have, I have used options. I mean, if, I, if I'm going to use options, it's more because of a probability price path giving me that confidence um, that I'm going to see a, 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 a strong move. So, like, for example, when the, uh, when the market topped out in February, I had an 80% price path that that was going to top out. I don't see that very often. I even told members. I'm like, look, I don't see 80% very often. Uh, you guys might want to uh, pay attention to this. So there, with the high probability, I was like, yeah, you know what? I think it's probably uh, worth a little bit more risk here. Um, if, but if the problem, you know, if I probably price paths are in the 60%, I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, we're going to get a tr the the the, the uh, a trigger um, at the 75% threshold. But you know, I might be less aggressive with those options. So options again are going to be a function of of my confidence level, um, less so uh, about other things when it comes to Bayesian. So last question of the night. I know you've been you've been waiting for me to say that, Lou. You've been, you've been amazing, uh, absolutely amazing. And and the questions are. I I apologize to everyone because this is going to be the last question of the night. And I know there are more. And I just really thank all of you for uh, contributing and being a part of this and and for sharing um, what's important to you. And we do welcome all of you to come in, ElliottWaveTrader.net. Just in addition to being able um, to come in and try the service and uh, get access to the analysis. And also be able to discuss the, the signals and questions with Luke. Uh, you know, you're also just welcome to come in if you have some initial questions before you even get started. Um, you know, use the contact form at ElliottWaveTrader.net. We'll be happy to get those questions answered for you. So, you know, Luke, there's been a lot of different markets. You know, so, some different markets since 2007. A lot of the recent moves have been very violent when we see to the downside. But just an overall question about if we saw a prolonged bear market and if we don't feel that we've maybe have seen that since you started trading Bayes live, have you ever maybe taken it back and looked at other markets um, and how it maybe would have performed if you had the data and uh, available from those time periods and, and just any thoughts you could have about navigating bull versus bear and, and how Bayes will look at that? That's a great question. Uh, the last prolonged bear market we have is obviously the Great Recession, 2008 and 9. I did start uh, the service, uh, well, not for, with you guys anyway, but uh, um, uh, in 2007. So you, um, uh, I do have some experiences trading in a somewhat more prolonged bear market. And uh, basically, um, once uh, the BTS identified that we should be generally be leaning short with most signals, um, uh, then if there's a learning process, of course, because obviously you're coming, coming from a, a bull market, uh, then it, it generally performed fine. It just, you just had a lot more set short signals. It would, uh, it would wait for opportunities, you know, these bear market rallies that you get instead of viewing a bear market rally as, oh, that's an impulsive wave. Let's get bullish. You know, the system learned. It said, ah, okay, I've seen this before. It's going to be back down. And so, you know, it's an iterative learning process. And so the, the huge uh, bear market rallies, you know, because I mean, how many five, seven, eight, even 11% one day moves were there uh, during that uh, housing crisis? I mean, there were quite a few of them. So it, you know, it, it, it learned, it adapted, and it evolved. And, and my expectation is if we enter, uh, if we happen to enter a long-term bear market now or 10 years from now, I feel confident going in a battle with Bayes. Um, uh, it, it's worked for me in the past. Uh, I'm going to stick with it. Uh, I like to trade probabilities. It's how I view the world. It fits my personality. 
Um, I believe in continuous learning and getting better at what I do. And, and the Bayesian system is built all around that. Um, and, it, and it's part of, part of who I am and, and what I try to try to offer others. So, um, uh, but yeah, ho hopefully I answered that question for you, Tom. I think that's fantastic. And so I just wanted to give you one uh, final chance, um, you know, one, one last option, some any parting shots um, to both members and, and non-members, um, those that have maybe tried ElliottWaveTrader.net before and those that are still on the fence, there's a, there's a wide audience here. So for all of them, um, what would you like to leave them with tonight uh, going forward, both with, um, I, I, well, actually I should say, either with just general comments um, or uh, specifically about Bayes? Okay, great. I appreciate that. You know, generally the markets are very, very challenging and very difficult. If it was really easy, we would all be sitting at home in our pajamas and our fuzzy slippers making millions of dollars. And we're not doing that, obviously. I would encourage you to become a, a, a historian and study markets and get an appreciation even for the economics. I know Elliott Wave, you know, obviously just, you know, has its own philosophy on these things, right? But more perspective for how markets move, uh, what's considered a win, um, you know, I mean, if, if I have a 16% year, do I consider that a loss? No, I don't at all. I mean, it was a challenging year. Uh, would I have liked to have had a 45% year? Absolutely. Um, if I get stuck in 10, 11, 12% years for the next 10 years, yeah, I'm, I might be disappointed at that time. Um, it's more about having a perspective for what's going on around you. I would encourage you uh, to look at um, uh, how other people are performing, whether it be the S&P 500 or uh, other money managers. I'd encourage you to try other Elliott Wave uh, analysts. I didn't, I'd encourage you to find a trading style that fits you. Trading is such a unique thing. Think about how we've earned our money. I put myself uh, through college. I was in, uh, financially independent for various reasons at age 14. I bought my first car. I put myself through college. I went in the Air Force to pay for college. I worked part-time. I, I, I have a relationship with my money and, and generally respecting that relationship between you and your money and putting in the time and the effort and the elbow grease before you go out there uh, and you and you and you trade and get and, and learn what works for you. Like there are some people that like to drive that Ferrari, right? They want to see those instant results day to day, um, and that's fantastic. All right, you're an intraday trader. Embrace it. Get really good at it. Um, some people are swing traders, right? Some people, uh, you know, generally want to be active in the market, but not like every second of every day. They they want to, you know, they they, they want to feel a part of the story. They want to average in positions and lock in profits and and feel uh, the satisfaction of that process. And some people don't even wanna be that involved and they wanna be long-term traders. And they wanna, they wanna generally enjoy their retirements or enjoy their lifestyles and, and buy and average in and, and generally try to get out if a nasty bear market's on the horizon. So you need to figure out what works best for you. Uh, what I offer at, at the Bayesian service is a swing trading service. We focus on swing trades. Um, can you utilize it for intraday? Sort of, but it's not really what it's designed for. It's designed for those that want to be modestly actively trading and engaged in their accounts. Uh, I do comment on longer term charts and obvious longer term charts. So I think it's also appropriate uh, for those that want to think longer term and maybe start positioning based off uh, probability assessments. Uh, I, I also provide anecdotes on when I'm getting in and out of longer term positions, which I which I'll, I throw up there as freebies. You know, it's just part of the conversation with members. Um, the purpose of Boots was to try to uh, try to help members who wanted that Ferrari experience. Um, I would say the systems uh, uh, started out a little, I'm, again, it's in the trade results, right? It's objective. Uh, system launched, uh, it was a little rocky out of the gate, like everything else, it's Murphy's Law, right? And then boom, we had like four months of just, boy, we were doing really well there, right? Um, and then we were doing pretty well all the way up until, until this historic price move with all the volatility. And now you're trying to trade 3X on top of all that volatility. Uh, the decision was made that hey we we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna uh, put this on ice for a bit um, and then you know we'll roll it back out nice and slow so for those that want to maybe even try to intraday uh, m maybe try a few of these 3x uh, SPXL uh, trades that we will we'll, that will be starting up again but generally the strength of the BTS uh, is the fact that it's been around since 2007 it's used by uh, a whole range of different types of people I consult with a whole range of different types of organizations. And, 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 and traders and investors. Um, uh, and, and generally it's a, it's a system based on probability and focusing on swing trades. Uh, the other information of longer term and short term are there for, uh, there for members. I stand behind it. If, 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 if I don't believe in it, then I, uh, I'm very quick to shut it down. Um, you know, I, uh, uh, and, and which is one reason why the boots was, was, uh, was shut down. I talked to Goose and I said, it's not a good time to be out there with that. So generally speaking, um, I wish you well in your journey. It's, it's a complicated, challenging, 
environment. Um, I would say the markets are going to continue to get more and more challenging. Um, whether we enter a nasty bear market now or enter a nasty bear market uh, five years from now, uh, you're going to have to have some wealth plan in place because if you long and hold over the next 20 years, you might be uh, very, very disappointed with where you're at. I encourage you to go take a look at the, uh, uh, the, the Japanese stock exchange. It peaked in 1990. That was the second largest economy in the world. And uh, on an inflation adjusted basis, it's down 80% in 30 years, approximately. So, you know, you, you go ask those buy and hold investors how that worked out for them. So if, if you are just going to blindly buy and hold for the next uh, several decades, uh, I would just at least encourage you to have some backup plan or set a, or, or, or some allocation strategy uh, in mind to prepare you for the challenges of the future. But in the meantime, uh, I'm, I'm around, I'm available. You got any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, uh, otherwise, everyone else at Elliott Wave is very helpful. Uh, it's been a great uh, teamwork. I've enjoyed working with everyone on the team and uh, hope, to, uh, hope to see you in the room.